the Bible, an ongoing bestseller that has endured for almost 2,000 years. Remarkably, the Bible's influence continues around the world in places as different as China, Africa, and the Middle East. But why? Some through the centuries have honored its writings as the Word of God, God's revelation to the human race. But others have thought of the Bible as merely a collection of old stories, the sayings of a rabbi named Jesus. In a modern, enlightened world, can an ancient book like the Bible really be considered God-breathed, inspired, offering timeless wisdom to all generations? The Bible, Why Does It Endure? Part 1 on this Day of Discovery. Today, a number of New Testament scholars are on a mission. Since the original 27 New Testament manuscripts have been lost, they're trying to get back to the exact wording of the biblical text as first written. One of these researchers is Daniel Wallace. He's given his life to the study of these ancient documents. This manuscript is so important for getting back to the text, uh, the original text of the New Testament, because it has a very pure stream of transmission. The Bible, called by many the Book of Books, it's sometimes described as an inspired library written by 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years, merging into one great story of a creator who then offers himself as the savior of a world that has turned its back on him. The first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses, who is thought to have written them sometime after Israel's exodus out of Egypt. The Apostle John completed the last of the Bible's 66 books while exiled on the island of Patmos off the coast of Turkey around 90 AD. That last book centers on the hero of the Bible's redemptive story. It's called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible divides between the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament contains 39 books. Written mainly in Hebrew, it's the Bible of the Jewish people. It declares belief in one God, and that monotheistic belief in a single deity stood in dramatic contrast to the many gods of the other ancient religions. Followers of Jesus believed that God continued to reveal himself in his plan when God himself became a man called Jesus in the first century AD. With this new revelation, 27 more books were added to the Bible. These New Testament books were written in Greek by gospel writers like Matthew, Mark, and John, and people like Luke, a doctor, and the Apostle Paul. Since that time, the Bible has been copied and recopied and distributed down through the centuries. Professor and scholar of the Greek language, Wallace is a kind of ancient manuscript detective. This manuscript has an extra column. This is the only place in the whole New Testament where Vaticanus has an extra column before it gets into the next book. But it does so three times in the Old Testament. There are some who have said that extra column here is to show us that this scribe knew of the longer ending of the last 12 verses of Mark, but he just chose not to put them in there. Wallace is looking for clues, clues from manuscript copies that lead him back to what was originally written by the authors of the New Testament. In Romans 5.1, what we have here is it says, uh, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what this manuscript has is instead of we have peace with God, it says, let us have peace with God. The difference is between an omega and an omicron, or a long O and a short O. The later scribe who retraced all these letters did not fill in the omega. He didn't trace over that, but he put a little O on top of it to show, I disagree with that, it should be we have peace with God. 
Dr. Wallace is so committed to recovering the wording of the original New Testament manuscripts that he's launched a monumental international project. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded in, in 2002. And our primary task is to go everywhere in the world where there are handwritten ancient Greek New Testament manuscripts and digitally photograph those so that their images will be preserved for generations to come. The Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts really has two goals. First, digitally photograph every single Greek New Testament manuscript that's in the world as much as we're given permission to do. That's over 5,700 manuscripts, 2.6 million pages of manuscript. We shoot them one page at a time. A lot of these manuscripts are on parchment, some are on paper, uh, some are on, on uh, papyrus. But it's the papyrus and the paper manuscripts, actually, especially the paper manuscripts, the later manuscripts that are falling apart faster than anything else. And so we're trying to get to these places before the manuscripts completely deteriorate. It would take us 10 years to get all those manuscripts photographed if we had two four-person teams working for 10 months a year, 10 years to get it done. So it, it's very exciting uh, to digitally preserve these manuscripts for the first time ever. Most of them have been microfilmed, not put in digital photography, is a stunning thing. And we have taken hundreds of thousands of pictures. It's just remarkable to, to see these images. And you can actually read the photograph more easily than you can read the manuscript. That's how good these uh, quality is. The second goal is to use all these images ultimately to help us recover the wording of the original New Testament as exactly as we possibly can. Because then that becomes the basis for published Greek New Testaments that are used by translators for all the languages in the world to get the New Testament into those languages. If the original wording can be confirmed, then scholars can tell if the Bible's message has been altered over time. We don't know exactly what the original text said in every place. We do know what it said in the vast majority of places, but there's still several hundred places where we're not sure. And the more manuscripts we can discover, the more manuscripts we can photograph, the more data we can put together, we have pieces of the puzzle that we're putting in there. And that's another piece of the puzzle that says, oh, now the picture's emerging this way. And the more pieces of the puzzle we can put in there, the better we have a chance of really getting back to the wording of the original. And that's the exciting work of CSNTM. Wallace describes how ancient Greek manuscripts were first written on woven plant material called papyrus. Later on, animal skins called parchment. And later still, copies were made on paper and then bound in a book form called a codex. It's always exciting and it's always stressful. We've been to places where they have manuscripts on paper, which is the later manuscripts were on paper, the earlier ones on parchment, which is animal skins, essentially. They'll, they'll use goats, they'll use antelope and other animals. But uh, earliest manuscripts are on papyrus, which is like paper. It's got the consistency of a paper shopping bag. Um, but it's fibers one way, then fibers the other way on the backside. So these uh, paper manuscripts, these one, this one site where we photographed them, when we got done shooting them, we told the librarian, don't ever open these books again. They will disintegrate. And we photographed them just in time before they would do that. If somebody just slammed it, the, the covers hard, it would just completely disintegrate. We went to another site where we wanted to shoot their manuscripts, and we were too late. They had paper manuscripts as well. And these are the more recent manuscripts, which means they may be only 800 years old instead of 1,200 years old, you know. But uh, these paper manuscripts had fallen apart so badly that when I opened up the cover, pieces of several pages just flew out. It was beyond hope at that point. We charge nothing for our work. We do it, we give them the images so they have a digital preservation of it. We keep archives of it and uh, we get the money raised simply by donations from institutes and individuals because it's a nonprofit organization. The first thing we have to do when we want to digitize uh, some manuscripts is we have to find out where these things are. And they are in 253 different sites throughout the world. We, in one year, were in 10 different countries to photograph manuscripts. We were in Australia, we were in New Zealand, in Europe, in Africa. There's even a manuscript in Japan, a Greek New Testament manuscript in Japan. I have no idea how it got there, 
but I know where it is. <laughs> there's one in Rio de Janeiro. So you, you've got manuscripts all over the place. There's plenty in America, but mostly in Europe and the Middle East. The Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts has discovered more Greek New Testament manuscripts since our inception than all of the individuals and all of the institutes in the world combined have discovered in that same time period. When we photograph these manuscripts and then analyze them, what is not at stake is what does the Christian faith really teach? That, frankly, in all essentials, is a settled issue. Uh, even scholars who don't believe the Bible but are good Bible scholars say the essentials of the Christian faith are not touched by this stuff. Uh, it's the other things that are touched by it. It's not whether life hangs in the balance, whether salvation hangs in the balance. What does hang in the balance is what did Paul mean here and how should I apply this to my life today? So there's, there's lots of little practical things. And how we function as churches, churches throughout the world operate differently because of their interpretation, sometimes because of a verse that they consider to be authentic when others don't see it as authentic. Um, so those are the things that do hang in the balance. Digitally photographing every Greek New Testament manuscript in the world requires commitment and a strategy. And that's the kind of challenge that Professor Wallace and the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts have taken on. This is the only institute in the world dedicated to digitally photographing all Greek New Testament manuscripts. And we have photographed more manuscripts of any sort than most institutes ever will at all. So we have a great deal of experience in this. And uh, it's just delightful to, to do this kind of a test. We go and preserve a manuscript and say, wow, I've never seen a manuscript quite like that. Every one of them is unique. And they all have a story to tell, which is, to me, just the, the fascinating human interest part of it. And then, on top of that, we get to use that to try to get back to the original text of the New Testament. One of the first things we do is we find out where the manuscripts are. We go to sites that are poor. We go to sites where they may not be able to care for the manuscripts as well as they'd like to. And we go to places where there's manuscripts that are not known to New Testament scholars yet, as well as manuscripts that are that are very important. And those are the kinds of places we go. We have to write letters to these institutes. We write in their native tongue. We always get somebody who can translate into that language, and then we usually pester them once or twice a year, and sometimes it takes years before they say, oh yeah, we'd love to have you come, just out of the blue. And they'll say, please come, join us, take pictures of our manuscripts. And finally, some of them get tired of us, keep bothering them year after year. They finally do say, yes, we'd love to have you come. And then I think they're very satisfied with the results. So then we go, and it's a four-person team to photograph these manuscripts. We use two cameras simultaneously and four people. And the equipment is uh, enormously expensive. We bring about 16 large pieces of luggage with us to go to these sites because we have to have all of the equipment on hand where we assume that the conditions are deplorable. Uh, and th they aren't necessarily, but for example, even at Cambridge University, you're gonna be in one of the ancient libraries. Don't expect to find wall plugs in there. So you have to bring pad batteries for your cameras, batteries for your computers. Everything has to be in your luggage that you're bringing right to that site to shoot. And so uh, we are in a number of places where some Eastern European countries where they, the government just shuts off the electricity for three or four hours a day for the entire country with, at, at their own random times without telling you, you don't know what's going to happen. And you're there on a pressure mission to get X amount of thousands of photographs done while you're there. You don't stop shooting because there's no electricity. You've got camera batteries and computer batteries and battery batteries for our uh, light panels and for our UV lamps and things like this. And we just keep going. One place, it was about 95 degrees outside. And every day, the government would shut off the electricity in, in the building. The windows did not open. And so we're just boiling in there and for three or four hours now there's no air no air conditioning you can't open the windows and it got well over 100 degrees in there we kept working because that's that's the kind of situation it is typically we we're working 16 hour days six days a week typically uh, it's a thrilling thing for me every single time i open up another new testament manuscript to look at a unique handwritten copy of the new testament it never gets old and I've, I've handled hundreds of them. 
I go, oh, this is, this is just great to see this manuscript. Look what the scribe did here, and he's talking about how many lines he wrote out and how long it took him to write this, and they put little statements about uh, the, the, the uh, writing of books, there is no end to this kind of thing, you know, quoting from Ecclesiastes and all. So we, we go on these trips, we photograph these manuscripts, we do a few hundred pictures a day. When we get out shooting them, then we have to go and compare these images. We shoot just the right side of the uh, manuscript first, then the left side. So we don't have two pages in an image. We have a single page. So it's as, as blocked as it can be, as closely cropped as it can be, so we can get as much resolution, and so we don't hurt the binding at all. And we have big foam wedges that are specially designed for us to hold it in place at a 90 to 105 degree uh, wedge and then we go back and we compare all the images to make sure if we've got 402 on the right side we'd better have 402 on the left side if we got 403 we made a mistake somewhere before we take one photograph we prepare these manuscripts by counting how many leaves there are by counting how many lines there are per page by counting by, by measuring the, the the manuscript and how many columns does it have what's the material that it's made out of what's the date of the manuscript that we typically have to estimate uh, what are the contents? And all this takes a couple of hours of preparation before we take one picture of any manuscript. So all that becomes part of what we call a prep doc to tell us all the data about that manuscript. It gives it a unique fingerprint. To me, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific high, really, if you want to describe it that way. That here's a manuscript nobody knows about. Now, the librarians at that institute may well know about it, and they usually do. but. New Testament scholars don't. They don't know about a manuscript until an institute in Germany categorizes and classifies that manuscript. When, when they know about it, New Testament scholars know about it. And we're on the frontier edge of that, so we're discovering these manuscripts, and then we report back to this institute in Germany, which, by the way, is about two years behind of categorizing the manuscripts that we've discovered and told them. They're trying to catch up, but we're discovering them at a very pretty fast rate. Every once in a while, a manuscript has a date in it where they actually put the year that the manuscript was written. We don't have a lot of manuscripts that do that, but several dozen that do that. And normally, up until about A.D. 1200, the date was from the time of the creation of Adam, according to Orthodox calendars. Then later, they used the A.D.B.C. kind of a system, but that was not done early on. And uh, so they'll put the date on the manuscript, and that becomes extremely important because the way scholars date a manuscript is they have to look at dated manuscripts and say, here's a fixed time in history when we know this is how the Greek handwriting was done. And it changes every 50 to 100 years. So you get enough of those per century, then you can see this is what we have in this century. And, and most of our manuscripts, we, are, we can be accurate within 100 years as to when they were uh, produced. And most of them don't have dates on them at all. Some of them we can be accurate within 50 years. We can't be accurate any closer than that, except if the scribe says, this is written in 1154, so then we can be very accurate. The Bible's New Testament was written from various regions throughout the Roman Empire during the first century AD. Those Greek manuscripts no longer exist, only handwritten copies. So scholars like Wallace compare families of manuscript evidence from different geographical regions, analyzing the variations. So how corrupt has the text become over time? And what difference do changes make? All scribes were humans, they all made mistakes, and because the printing press was not invented until 1454, no two manuscripts are exactly alike, period. Uh, all of them have differences, and there's several hundred differences between our two closest manuscripts, maybe even a couple thousand differences between the two closest. You multiply that out by all the Greek New Testament manuscripts we have, and then the manuscripts in other ancient languages. The New Testament was translated into a number of different languages early on because of missionary endeavor. They translated into Latin. We have 10,000 Latin New Testament manuscripts today. They translated into Syriac. We have at least 1,500 of those in Coptic and Armenian and Gothic and Georgian and Old Church Slavonic and Arabic. And, you know, just this was the gospel exploding into the Mediterranean world into various tongues and languages so people could have it. We compare all that data, and what we discover is hundreds of thousands of variations as to what the wording of these manuscripts is. Now, that sounds like we can't get back to the original text at all. 
But when you begin to realize that 99% of those variations can't even be translated, or if they can be translated, they make no difference whatsoever, then all of a sudden you say, now I'm dealing with just a few hundred differences that are significant. And it, once again, they don't impact the essentials of the Christian faith. Somewhere along the line, this guy copied from this guy, or maybe several line, uh, points down the line. But um, as I examine this and I see the differences among the manuscripts, I still have to ask the question, are these manuscripts generally reliable as witnesses to the original text? If they're written in the second century or the 16th century, are they generally reliable? So you'll have a manuscript that says, he said to them, Jesus spoke to his disciples, that's what it's talking about. A later scribe will come along and he'll want to clarify who the he is and who the them is, and so he'll change he to Jesus and them to the disciples. Now, when a third scribe comes along and he sees both of these manuscripts, who's going to leave out the name of Jesus when he's writing out what the, scribes, uh, what the manuscript said? So he's going to put the name of Jesus in there, and so you get growth through clarification and through piety and through liturgical use over the centuries. But it is not a lot of growth. One of the most remarkable things about New Testament manuscripts is this. Over the 1,500 years we have of the copies being done by hand of New Testament manuscripts up, up until the time of the printing press, we have a growth that we'd expect. It's kind of like a snowball going down a hill. It's going to pick up all sorts of stuff. But how much growth do you have over those 1,500 years? 2%. That's how much the manuscripts have changed over 1,500 years. I've done an experiment for the last 31 years called the Gospel According to Snoopy Seminar, where I take people at a church or a college or university. I've done it a number of places. I've done it now 68 times. It's a weekend seminar. It takes eight hours. I get 22 scribes who copy out an ancient text through six generations of copies. Each one of them is given instructions like, you're hard of hearing, so you're going to make mistakes of sound, or you're a sloppy writer, and so the next person might not be able to read what you wrote, or you want to add to the text some pietistic stuff. The next day, and that's Friday night, the next day we get all the textual critics to together to try to reassemble what the original text said, but we threw away all the first generation copies. We threw away most of the second generation copies and third, and so they've got some manuscripts to work with, with lots of gaps, and after about four hours, these untrained lay people are putting together what this text says, and what they have noticed is there are about three or four times as many textual variants as we have words in that original text. That's more than what we have for the New Testament. And on top of that, the text has grown through its six generation copies about 20 to 30 percent, which is 10 times greater than what we have for the New Testament in 1500 years. And yet, in the 68 times I have done this, the average that these groups get is within one word of the original text. Many times we've gotten to the original, the worst group I ever had, missed it by six words, Stanford PhDs. What can I say? Yeah. When people know about the Bible, that doesn't mean they've read very much of it. And so there's a sense of, well, this is an important book, morals, but they don't, most people I think think of it as, as filled with fables, and so they don't want to get into those issues at all. Um, what they don't fully appreciate is that regardless of what your view of the Bible is, this is the single most influential book that has ever been produced in Western civilization and probably in world civilization. And consequently, if we want to understand anything about our history as a people, as human beings, this is a book that we need to, to devour and read and understand. So according to scholars like Dan Wallace, we today can hold in our hands words written down centuries ago by prophets, shepherds, kings, and fishermen. But why have these words endured? According to the Bible itself, these words are a gift from God. But according to those who have read these words and thought about them and then embraced them, this book endures because it's a mirror of the soul and a light to the path that brings us back to our God.